let's continue our discussion of type 1 and type 2 errors. In the table shown here, the columns represent the underlying true state of reality of the null hypothesis, something that in general we never know. Either the null hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false. The rows of the table represent the decision made by the researcher to either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Let's examine what happens with the different possible combinations of decisions and underlying states of reality. Let's assume for the sake of illustration and without loss of generality that we are conducting a two-sided test at some level of significance alpha for a population mean. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, the decision will be to reject the null. If in reality the null is indeed false, the decision to reject the null is the correct decision to make and no error has been made. If the p-value is greater than alpha, the decision will be to fail to reject the null. If in reality the null is indeed true, the decision to fail to reject the null is the correct decision to make and again no error has been made. Now come the errors. If the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, the decision will be to reject the null. If in reality the null is indeed true, the decision to reject the null is not the correct decision to make and an error has been made. If the p-value is greater than alpha, the decision will be to fail to reject the null. If in reality the null is indeed false, the decision to fail to reject the null is not the correct decision to make and an error has been made. Rejecting the null when the null is true is called a type 1 error and is denoted by the Greek symbol alpha. This is the same alpha used to represent the significance level of the test and so when one selects the significance level they are choosing the type 1 or alpha error rate. Failing to reject the null when the null is false is called a type 2 error and is denoted by the Greek symbol beta. Beta is related to statistical power and will be discussed further in section 5 of this module. The type 1 or alpha error occurs when we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. Using the legal analogy discussed by Motulski in the reading for this module, the type 1 error is analogous to convicting an innocent person. The type 2 or beta error occurs when we fail to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false and the alternative is actually true. Using the legal analogy, this is analogous to failing to convict a guilty person. Sticking with the legal analogy, one can argue that the type 1 error is the more serious error to make and is treated as such within our legal system. Within the clinical research realm, the more serious of the two errors may depend on the goals of the study, and the values for alpha and beta can be selected by the researcher as they deem appropriate. In general, the type 1 error is almost always set at 0.05 and has become a rather ingrained value. For fixed sample size, there is a trade-off between the alpha and beta error rates. If you decrease the alpha error rate so that you make fewer type 1 errors, this will cause the beta error rate to increase, resulting in more type 2 errors. This increases the importance of considering which of the two errors are more serious to commit. If you want to decrease both the alpha and beta error rates, or decrease the beta error rate without changing the alpha error rate, then you need to increase the overall sample size of your study, which will in turn increase the cost and potentially accrual time of the study. As a result, careful consideration should be given to overall sample size and desired alpha and beta error rates. Typically, in a randomized controlled trial, alpha is set to 0.05 and beta is set to 0.20. In section 5 of this module, we will discuss the relationship between alpha, beta, and statistical power.
Let's now turn our attention to the relationship between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. There is a duality that exists between them that turns out to be very useful and informative. For the purposes of illustration, let's return to the body temperature data example and assume that our null hypothesis is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and we are conducting a two-sided test at the standard 0.05 alpha level. There are two cases to consider. In the first case, the value specified in the null hypothesis is contained in the 95% confidence interval as shown in the figure. If this is the case, then the following will be true. The p-value for this hypothesis test will be greater than 0.05 and as a result the conclusion will be to fail to reject the null hypothesis. In the second case, the value specified in the null hypothesis is not contained in the 95% confidence interval. When this happens, the following will be true. The p-value for the hypothesis test will be less than or equal to 0.05 and as a result the conclusion will be to reject the null hypothesis. This provides us with the following general rule. If a 95% confidence interval does not contain the value of the null hypothesis, then the result is statistically significant with p-value less than or equal to 0.05. If a 95% confidence interval does contain the value of the null hypothesis, then the result is not statistically significant, interpreted as a p-value greater than 0.05. There are several important things to note here. First, this relationship exists between a two-sided hypothesis test at significance level alpha and a corresponding 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. For example, this holds for a two-sided 0.05 test and a 95% confidence interval, or a two-sided 0.10 test and a 90% confidence interval. Second, this essentially means that the conclusion from a two-sided hypothesis test can be inferred from the corresponding confidence interval, although the exact p-value cannot be determined from the confidence interval. Strictly speaking, in a formal hypothesis test, the only relevant information needed about the p-value is whether or not it is less than or equal to alpha or greater than alpha, not how much less than or greater than alpha it actually is. This is one of several reasons that many in the clinical research community advocate the use of confidence intervals over p-values because the conclusion of the hypothesis test can be inferred from the confidence interval. Additionally, it is felt that the confidence interval provides more useful information than the p-value about the population parameter. An unfortunate result of using the term statistical significance to describe the result of a hypothesis test is that it has led to a great deal of confusion and incorrect interpretation in the literature regarding its relationship, or lack thereof, to scientific and clinical importance. There are three possible things that can occur when the null hypothesis has been rejected and the result declared to be statistically significant. 1. The null hypothesis is true and the observed result has occurred strictly because of random sampling variability. 2. The null hypothesis is really false, the alternative hypothesis is true, and the observed result is scientifically and or clinically important. 3. The null hypothesis is really false, the alternative hypothesis is true, and the observed result is scientifically and or clinically trivial. There is really no way of distinguishing between these three possibilities. The clinical researcher needs to carefully consider and synthesize relevant statistical, design, and clinical information to reach a meaningful conclusion. This can sometimes be a difficult task, and the tendency to rely too heavily on the notion of statistical significance can occur unintentionally.
The term statistically significant simply means that the calculated p-value is less than or equal to alpha, where alpha has been set a priori before collection and analysis of the data. P-values and hypothesis tests are intended to establish that what has been observed exceeds what would be expected to occur as a function solely of random sampling variability. P-values and hypothesis tests are not intended to distinguish between clinically meaningful and clinically insignificant results. That remains the sole responsibility of the clinical researcher. The same confusion about significance terminology applies to very small p-values. It is common for researchers to qualify the results of a hypothesis test as very significant or extremely significant when the p-value that leads to rejection of the null hypothesis is very small. Is it the case that a p-value equal to 0.004 is more significant than a p-value equal to 0.04? Strictly speaking, once the significance level has been set, the result is either statistically significant or not statistically significant. If there is interest in interpretation of the magnitude of a p-value beyond that needed to conduct a hypothesis test, it may be better to not engage in hypothesis testing and simply report and interpret actual p-values. A related idea is the practice of using asterisks in graphs or tables to designate the magnitude of the p-values in the table where a single asterisk is usually used to designate a p-value less than 0.05, a double asterisk for p-values less than 0.01, and a triple asterisk used for p-values less than 0.001. The general recommendation is to avoid these types of practices particularly if using the hypothesis testing framework. If a hypothesis test is not needed, a better approach may be to simply provide exact p-values for all tests conducted and avoid use of terms involving the word significance as much as possible. Another related issue is that of borderline p-values. It's common for researchers to describe the result of a hypothesis test where the p-value is slightly larger than the alpha level as being almost significant or marginally significant or even as having a trend towards significance. When a two-tailed p-value is between 0.05 and 0.10, some are tempted to switch to a one-tailed p-value. The one-tailed p-value in most but not all cases is equal to half the two-tailed p-value, and so it will be less than 0.05 and almost as if by magic the result becomes statistically significant. This practice is inappropriate and decisions about using a one- or two-tailed alternative hypothesis should be made prior to collection of the data. Again. The general recommendation is to avoid these practices and simply report the actual p-value and not worry whether or not it meets the alpha threshold. If the hypothesis actually merits use of a formal test, then the notion of borderline significance doesn't make much sense, and the result should be considered not statistically significant. If the result is actually not significant, how should this be reported and interpreted? As we have discussed, the correct interpretation is that there is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Further, large p-values do not prove the null hypothesis. The use of confidence intervals can be especially helpful in the interpretation of results that are not statistically significant. If the confidence interval contains values that are scientifically trivial, then make a strong negative con conclusion about the result. If the confidence interval includes values that may have scientific importance in addition to the null value, then the study may be considered inconclusive. Here are a few closing thoughts. 1. Be careful when using the term significant. 
because of the common confusion between statistical significance and scientific importance, it's probably best to avoid this term when possible. When using the term, clearly distinguish between statistical significance and clinical significance. 2. Report actual p-values. This provides the reader with full information about the strength of evidence against the null hypothesis and also allows the reader to apply their own alpha criterion to the data if they so choose. 3. Use p-values and confidence intervals together whenever possible. The clearest presentations are those that provide the most information to the reader. If the p-value and the confidence interval are presented together, there is often little need to include extraneous significance language in the reporting of results. This concludes our discussion of hypothesis testing and statistical significance.